Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Carl Gershman. I'm the president of the National Endowment for Democracy, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone to our discussion today of the new uh, report, a full spectrum response to sharp power, the vulnerabilities and strengths of open societies, which has been co-authored by Chris Walker and Jessica Ludwig. This report is the product of an effort by the NEDS International Forum for Democratic Studies to systematically analyze the ways in which the leading authoritarian regimes exert sharp power in a diverse range of settings and sectors, including media and the information space, knowledge generation, commerce, and technology. The report is part of the forum's sharp power and democratic resilience series that over the past seven years has sought to understand the impact of authoritarian influence and activities that extend beyond their own borders as leading authoritarian regimes have adapted their repressive capacities to the modern era. The forum first began exploring these challenges in 2014 through a series of expert convenings that led to, in six, 2016, to the publication of the edited volume, Authoritarianism Goes Global, the Challenge to Democracy, recognizing Beijing and Moscow's ambitions in particular. The forum then undertook an 18-month initiative to analyze on the ground the on the ground impact of authoritarian state linked influence initiatives targeting the information and ideas space in four emerging democracies in Central Europe and Latin America. This led to the forum's publication in December 2017 of the pivotal report sharp power, rising authoritarian influence, which was immediately the focus of a cover story in The Economist magazine and the adoption of the sharp power concept by writers, analysts, and policymakers across the world. The term caught on because it graphically captured the new threat to free expression, pluralism, and democracy. Namely, as the report noted, the authoritarian's determination to monopolize ideas, suppress alternative narratives, and exploit partner institutions in the democracies. The concept thereby contributed to a growing debate about the ways in which the global political landscape has been radically and dangerously altered by the weaponization of information by malign authoritarian powers. As Chris and Jessica have written, while democracies may not yet be sufficiently focused on the activities of authoritarian regimes, the authoritarians are intensely interested in the democracies and in exploiting their vulnerabilities. And this, this has to change, and that's the purpose of the report, which urges the autocrats which urges that the autocrats divide and conquer methods which threaten democratic institutions and fundamental freedoms must be met with democratic unity and by the participation in the response by the full spectrum of institutions that within open societies, especially civil society, which broadly understood as a crucial part of the democrats democracy's competitive advantage over the authoritarian states. In this new environment, a range of actors in the non-governmental sector must develop strategies for resilience that reinforce standards of openness, accountability, and international integrity. We hope that today's report launch discussion will highlight opportunities for democracies 
and their civil societies to develop in innovative responses to sharp power that will contribute to, that will contribute to safeguarding at democracy in our very perilous world. It's now my great pleasure to turn the floor over to the co-author of this report of this important report, Jessica Ludwig. Jessica, congratulations. The floor is over, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carl, for those kind words and for introducing our discussion today. The report we are launching, which I've had the great pleasure of co-authoring with my endowment colleague, Christopher Walker, who's not on the panel today, is very much the result of many leading minds from various backgrounds and disciplines coming together to exchange ideas and, perspect and perspectives towards the common cause of identifying opportunities to bolster democratic resiliency in the face of challenges presented by authoritarian sharp power. We are grateful to the numerous experts and civil society representatives from around the globe who participated in the series of roundtable discussions and workshops that the forum organized over the past two years. Among these, I would especially like to highlight the authors of the eight papers in the Sharp Power and Democratic Resilience series, who examined the impact of authoritarian sharp power influence in the four public sphere domains that this series explores. Thanks are also owed to the many forum and endowment colleagues who contributed to this initiative in various ways. In particular, I would like to mention the integral role of our former colleague, Shanti Kalafil, in shaping the scope of the series and also recognize Ariane Gottlieb for providing vital research assistance during the production of the final report. There are serious vulnerabilities in a cluster of institutions that form the central nervous system of modern open societies. Hastened by globalization and digitalization, institutions such as media outlets, universities, think tanks, publishers, technology companies, and entertainment firms, among others, have developed deep relationships across the autocratic democratic divide. Through these conduits and nodes of shared activity, autocratic powers such as the People's Republic of China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia are, are recalibrating incentives in ways that conflict with standards of democratic accountability and interfere with freedom of expression. When this critical system is exposed to malign influence, the adverse reverberations can be profound. The stakes are high as crucial governance norms are being contested on an ongoing basis in spheres related to the media and information ecosystem, knowledge generation, commerce, and emerging technologies. A full spectrum response on the part of democracies is essential for safeguarding the institutions and open societies that reflect democratic values and provide space for civic participation. Civil society, broadly understood, is a critical part of democracy's competitive advantage over authoritarian states. And thus, the reason that we are seeking to identify opportunities for civil society to contribute to countering authoritarian sharp power influence through innovative democratic responses. We have invited three of the authors from our report series to join today's discussion to help us unpack both the ways that, authority, that autocratic regimes have sought to exploit vulnerabilities vulnerabilities of open societies, and at the same time, discuss how civil society can help democracies regain the upper hand. Since we have circulated their bios in advance, I'll just give a brief word of introduction for each of the speakers who are joining us. First, we will hear from Edward Lucas, a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for Inter or, sorry, excuse me, the Center for European Policy Analysis, a journalist and the author of four books, as well as the report in this series, Firming Up Democracy's Soft Underbelly, Authoritarian Influence and Media Vulnerability. Next, we'll turn to Nadej Roland, Senior Fellow for Political and Security Affairs at the National Bureau of Asian Research. Among the many reports, edited volumes, and other articles, uh, including a book that she has published, which delve into different aspects of China's, excuse me, China's domestic, foreign, and defense policy, Grand Strategy and Changes in Global Dynamics Resulting from the Rise of China, she is author of the report, Commanding Ideas, Think Tanks as Platforms of Authoritarian Influence. Third, Nicholas Wright, a neuroscientist and technology researcher with affiliations at Georgetown University, University College of London, and the New America Foundation, who holds both a medical degree and a PhD, will share analysis related to his report, Artificial Intelligence and Democratic Norms meeting the authoritarian challenge. 
After our contributing report authors, Mark Plattner, founding co-editor co emeritus of the Journal of Democracy and a current NED board member, will lend us his depth of experience to help contextualize the current set of challenges to democracy globally. Then there will be a Q&A period with the speakers following our initial discussion. We invite all of you who are tuning in to submit your questions at any time during the event by using the YouTube chat feature, and we look forward to taking these up later in the conversation. For those of you who are active on Twitter, you can also follow along during the conversation by following the forum at Think Democracy or by using the hashtag NetEvents. So first, I would like to invite Edward Lucas to kick off our conversation and uh, ask you to uh, share with us your insightful observations about how some of these changing dynamics uh, over the past, um, the recent period and really over a the past decade even, um, have created, have proved to be um, proved to um, be vulner some vulnerabilities in the, the media, media system and information space in particular. Um, and Edward, I hope you can also um, touch on some recommendations that you've been able to offer um, in your report for um, what can be done uh, in this particular sphere. Well, thanks so much, Jessica. Good afternoon from rainy London. I think I don't need the word rainy, really. That's just in the in the price. And I yearn for the days when we can meet atom to atom rather than electron to electron. Um, I really want to start off just by thanking you not just for hosting this, but also for coining the phrase sharp power and for this splendid series of reports. It was a privilege to write the first one, and it's been a delight to read all the other ones since. I'm going to just offer a few observations on how we got here and how we might get out of it and try and do that in um, eight to ten minutes as requested. And then I look forward to a vigorous uh, discussion. I, and I suppose the first point, um, which we have yet to get across to many of the decision makers and people in the policy community, is that this there isn't an easy answer to this. This is not a question of you know, we used to spend money on X and now we need to spend money on Y. Um, this is a very deep problem. It goes to the heart of the way our societies work um, that allows our adversaries to attack us. And we have to put aside any expectation that there's going to be a quick or easy fix. This is going to be a long, slow, difficult process during which we will make mistakes and we'll have to learn from those mistakes. And we're starting from a long way behind. The second point is that nobody made us do this. We did not have Russian or Chinese tanks crunching down the street of the city of London or Wall Street or coming into the, um, sailing up the Thames or up the Hudson River and turning their guns on our financial institution saying, open your system to our dirty money, otherwise we open fire. No, this was um, it, what, what fundamentally what in tennis would be called unforced errors. We did this to ourselves. Um, we decided that we would put the um, convenience and enjoyability of technological change over safety and security. We decided we'd put profits um, ahead of resilience and other factors in our financial system, we have basically allowed our enemies to make headway. Now, sometimes there is coercion. We see this particularly um, from the Russian Federation, sometimes in its um, in neighboring countries, and we see this quite a lot now from China. But this builds on a long period of um, us indulging our adversaries because we thought we would get away with it and it didn't really matter. Uh, the third point I want to make is that this is not a new problem. It may be new on the cover of The Economist. It's new in terms of our um, the, the focus, but it has its roots 30, 40 years ago. And it's really new to people who haven't been paying attention. And I think we always we, we must start off any discussion of this by paying tribute to the, for example, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Poles, Ukrainians and indeed Russians who warned us back in the 1990s about this threat from Russia, which they were already experiencing the combination of subversion, dirty money, media 
um, infiltration and, uh, and, uh, uh, and manipulation and so on. And we were very unwilling to take seriously that, that this mattered even to them and let alone um, that it might one day matter to us. So we are we are late on this in what one might call the Old West. And it was not because we weren't warned. We were warned and we patronized and belittled and ignored um, the people who were um, trying who were, who were trying to warn us. Our weaknesses are also our strengths. This is one of the paradoxes here um, that the indiscipline the unwillingness to toe the party line, to do as we're told, uh, creates opportunities for those who want to play divide and rule games, whether it's getting Hungary to veto a declaration on Hong Kong from the EU, getting Germany to uh, accept a highly politicised gas pipeline and then another one, um, the recruiting of our Dis retired decision makers onto boards we've just seen in France with François Filon um, joining a, basically what one might call part of the Russian party state. And it's absolutely true that these freedoms are abused and our inability to stick together means that we um, often get um, picked on and isolated and give our enemies uh, the, uh, the advantage. But that's also potentially the source of strength because it allows spontaneity and experimentation. And this is something that particularly the Chinese Communist Party, but also to some extent the Russians, um, find very hard to deal with. They don't understand really the way free, society, free societies work. Um, to me, this was always exemplified by Gorbachev in Vilnius in 1990. Um, when he was visiting there, there was a big pro-independence demonstration and Raisa Gorbachev said, who told you to make that placard? And the Lithuanian said to her, no one told me, I made it myself. And that's still a sort of the, 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 the misunderstanding they have about how free societies work. and We do have the opportunity to do stuff spontaneously um, is a tremendous advantage with all the creativity and initiative that brings. So the division is also diversity and discipline is also spontaneity. There's a, a second paradox, which is that the free market economic system, which led to our victory um, over, um, over communism by generating not just prosperity, but fun in a way that the Soviet planned economy couldn't, couldn't do, generated the blue jeans and the rock and roll um, and all the other things that, that behind the Iron Curtain um, seemed so unattainable and enviable that the free market economic system has become a vulnerability because if it's stripped of its um, of the values um, that should underpin it, I always recommend when people talk about free markets and I say, have you read Adam Smith? And they say, yes, I've read The Wealth of Nations. And I say, yes, but have you also read the other book that goes with it, The Theory of Moral Sentiments? Um, the Stripped of, stripped of values, the free market system, the ruthless pursuit of profit above everything else does offer our adversaries tremendous opportunities. They buy their way um, into positions of political power and the people who are selling them those positions of political power say, I'm just doing um, my bit for my shareholders. It's not my business if this ends up with the Chinese um, having a monopoly of, of rare earth production or the Russian Federation having its thumbs on the throat of Europe when it comes to gas supplies. And so there's a paradox there. We have to rethink the way we approach um, economic decision making and make sure that national security considerations and indeed moral considerations are um, built into our decision making. And I think that's happening. And we see already that um, using forced labor from um, what the Chinese call Xinjiang and what um, other people might call occupied East Turkestan is politically toxic now and we see companies thinking I just don't want the grief of this. Now this also means they get grief in China because if you accept there's um, grief from the human rights people in the West then you're going to get um, whacked in China from the other direction. But it, it's a reminder to our business decision makers that they do fundamentally operate in a moral universe that they have to make their decisions and take the consequences. And so I think that the tide is, is turning on that. One of the fundamental weapons that particularly the Russians have on the values front is, is nihilism. And that's another paradox. In the, during the Cold War, um, whether we were dealing with communist China or particularly with the, the Soviet Union, there was a very strong clash of values that you met communist propagandists who genuinely believed and would argue to some extent convincingly 
that Marxism and Marxist-Leninism was a way forward. It would lead to a superior civilization. And even if mistakes were made and the odd tens of millions of people died along the way, um, there was a better tomorrow. And one of the strange differences that we have now in this kind of new Cold War or whatever one wants to call it, is the absence of that sort of universalist message it doesn't come from the Chinese Communist Party. It certainly doesn't come from um, Vladimir Putin's Kremlin. And what one gets is a kind of uh, you know, self-interested nationalism or ethno-nationalism in the case of the Chinese Communist Party. But there's no there's no real um, you know, convincing universalist message. A little bit of rhetoric, perhaps, on the Chinese side with common destiny and so on. Um, but much more, particularly from the Russians, one gets this sort of nihilism, nothing really matters, everybody's a crook, everything's ridiculous, your system's no better than ours. And this set me thinking of what is the opposite of nihilism, and it's quite interesting, if you look at a dictionary of synonyms and anty antonyms, there isn't really a word of somethingism, the opposite of nihilism. But that's what we need to think of, we need to find the antidote to the Russian nihilist message that everything is just a, a sham and a joke and a fake and not to be taken seriously and reassert the idea there is such a thing as truth that human relations matter trust is really important um, trusting people is a good thing to do being trusted is really nice and so on the specific points that i've got are one follow the money i just gave evidence to uh, the house to, to congress the house foreign affairs committee on this and they very commendably have a, um, a hearings and a pursuing um, inquiries into the overlap between kleptocracy and the authoritarian threat particularly from russia but actually it's also from china and i'm really impressed by the way in which the united states has begun to move on this and i think it hasn't been fully appreciated in other western countries that the United States, which used, frankly, to be a bit of a laggard um, when it came to things like beneficial ownership, shell companies, and so on, is now um, is now a leader. The National Defence Authorization Act and NDAA, first of January, included a very important provision on uh, registries of beneficial ownership. Now, of course, the question is. Um, how it will be implemented. Will FinCEN have the leadership and the resources needed to do that? Um, how will these things be applied? But this is certainly wait, this is something we've been wait, we've been wanting for 10 or 15 years. And now it's here and the onus now is on other countries to see if they can match that. And I hope very much that when um, President Biden was in Britain, that among the other tough messages he gave to Boris Johnson may be one that Britain is the money laundering capital of the world. And if, they, if Britain wants to keep its friendly relations with the United States, this has to cease. And there's certainly plenty of scope for improvement. But I feel that the tide is, is turning on this. And money is so often the key enabler of this, whether it's money and media ownership, money and supply chains, money and uh, the laundering of the proceeds of crime. Again and again, it, the, the structures that we have allowed to be created, the, no one ever said, let's have a debate on creating anonymous companies registered with an out-of-date driving license and a fake name. This has just sort of crept up on us. This was never um, debated or decided in democratic societies. But the tide is turning against that, and that, that that's very welcome or make life difficult. Um, the second point, um, which is, um, is to protect the individuals, um, the soft target protection. And this is a very sharp contrast here between people who work in government and people who don't. If you work in government and the Chinese or the Russians or the Saudis or anybody else is going after you, it's a very big deal. And it doesn't happen very often for that reason. If you harass an American diplomat, um, stuff happens. People write about it. The government gets get, get, gets cross. And um, there's a very clear uh, sort of playbook for how you respond. Um, if you are a journalist, a human rights campaigner, someone who works for an NGO, a critical academic, anyone in that space, in most countries, if you get harassed by the Russians or the Chinese, you're on your own. You may well find that your employer dumps you because you're too troublesome and expensive. You may face crippling legal costs. You may have psychological problems. Your um, online um, existence may be um, harassed. You get hacked and doxxed and all these things. And we need to get a lot better at this soft target protection. We need to have a kind of democracy's playbook about how to make sure that people who get targeted like this um, get the support that they need. There are countries that do this. Finland 
is actually really good at this behind the scenes because they've had experience of what happens when you don't. But we need to articulate this and make this part of our deterrence, in fact. And if you, if you do this, not only will the individual be protected, but the people who do the harassing can expect some consequences. And that would ensure this doesn't happen, would create more space for people who want to um, do pushback in this sort of civil society grey zone. And the third and final point is that sunlight is really important. Almost all this stuff works its secret. If we could publish the names of everybody involved in the um, skyjacking of the Belarusian journalist, Roman Patevich, um, from the air traffic controllers who gave the order through to the people who went onto the plane and tried to bully the Ryanair staff into um, giving um, video evidence that the plane hadn't been forced down through to the people in the jail, the guy who did the interview on television, all, that. all those people, their names, their faces should be on websites with uh, uh, clear normative pressure that these are not people that you want to have any dealings with. Um, on top of that, obviously, visa sanctions, asset freezes and all the rest. We need to, once you have the sunlight, you can then apply the normative, the regulatory, the legal, the counterintelligence, the, every other sort of um, pressure that you've got. Um, and it won't just be the government doing it on its own, it gives everybody else the chance to pitch in. So I'm going to stop there. I think that's the end of my um, uh, eight to ten minutes. I really look forward to um, the discussion and thank you again for the privilege of being able to contribute to this program. Thank you so much, Edward. I um, wanted to put you first in the, the speaking lineup because I thought you would do such a good job of setting the scene of how we arrived here at the current moment um, and really appreciate your observations. Next, I'd like to um, ask Nadej um, to comment on uh, what's really a domain of the public sector that's really the most critical and perhaps sacred uh, for in order for democracies to be able to flourish. And that is the realm of and um, guaranteeing space for free and freedom of intellectual inquiry. Nadej, how uh, in your research have you seen and observed the ways that authoritarian regimes are playing in this space? Um, what kinds of strategies are they adopting um, to either flood the information space, co-opt actors, or exert control uh, over narratives that are being discussed, um, not just within their borders, but beyond them as well? Yes, thanks, Jessica. You actually have uh, defined the outline for, for my, my remarks. Uh, uh, but I want to start by thanking you and, and the NED team for uh, including me in this very um, important project. It's been um, a, a very interesting journey and I've, I've learned a lot from my colleagues' uh, work as well in research. Um, I just want to start with some general observations and then I will zoom in into the impact on, of sharp power into this knowledge generation sector and finish with uh, maybe a few observations about what, what can we do um, about it. Um, so just um, putting it back into the context, you know, the sharp power phenomenon has really emerged out of um, our attempt to, to integrate authoritarian powers within the international liberal system. Um, authoritarian states are now using the globalized flows of uh, money, information, and knowledge to do outside of their borders, to do internationally what they used to do mostly domestically. This is really essentially an externalization of practices that until recently were quite limited or, or mostly implemented at home. Um, the authoritarians' ability to exert that kind of influence outside of their borders has been facilitated by globalization, but also has been uh, possible mainly because of their wealth, as, as Edward just reminded us. It's, it's really everything that um, is important to understand. It's this, this money that's flowing, and it's not because they have any ideological appeal. Um, so that's important to, to remember. And, and I think this is particularly striking uh, in the knowledge production sector. Um, at home, you know, authoritarians deny their intellectual elites the ability to think outside of uh, predetermined 
political parameters. Uh, scholars and think tankers and experts, they are expected to support and serve the state's objectives. First and foremost, for example, authoritarians do not have a tradition of think tanks. Uh, this is something that, um, you know, until the mid 2000s, um, most of the research centers in uh, authoritarian countries were either fully integrated within state or party bureaucracies or altogether non-existent. Um, after all, this is logical, you know, the ability to think independently and critically about government policy um, is utterly at odds with uh, what is permissible uh, in any authoritarian system. But these governments seem to have realized that expertise um, could not only be useful for their own decision making in, in a world that's increasingly complex, uh, but also in support of their international agenda. And authoritarian countries share a lot of similarities in this domain. What varies is mostly the geographical extent of uh, their efforts. Um, they share similar objectives in the fact that um, they're mostly, first of all, they're mostly defensive at the beginning. You know, they're trying to reduce or to shut down um, other countries' ability to criticize their regime or criticize um, their actions. But there's more and more an offensive element to it too, a very proactive effort to try to shape the conversations about themselves. Um, they want to be accepted as legitimate actors. Uh, they want to justify their policies and they want those policies to be endorsed and supported by other countries as well. Um, the scholars and experts in, in this particular context are mostly agents of the state. Uh, they are not independent thinkers. They are relaying the version, the only version of the truth uh, that is allowed. Um, Authoritarians curate the agenda, they're trying to confine the discussions within boundary, boundaries that they define. Um, they're trying to marginalize voices that are um, deemed threatening or critical. Uh, and they are both trying to constrict the space uh, for dissenting views and opinions and also spreading their preferred narratives um, outside. In addition to this effort to, to shape the discussion in a way that's more favorable to, to them, uh, think tanks and knowledge centers in general increasingly appear as platforms for influence operations. Authoritarian powers are using them to co-opt uh, local intellectual elites uh, that will then serve as uh, relays for their own talking points and their own narratives so that basically they're creating intermediaries that will uh, disseminate the same kind of language and narrative that they are that those authoritarian powers and governments are doing. Needless to say, um, these practices um, are harmful and contradictory to liberal democratic principles of freedom of speech and of thought, but also um, of diversity and pluralism. What's, what was interesting to me uh, when I uh, started the research for, for, for the report on, on, uh, on this ideational space was to understand that authoritarians share similar objectives and they employ similar tactics in this broader um, ideational space. What's interesting though, is that their, the geographical scope of their operations uh, varies very, uh, very greatly. Um, the Gulf monarchies, for example, um, seem to be mostly interested in shaping the perceptions of their immediate neighbors and of um, some of the um, advanced industrial uh, democracies. I would argue that Russia is the same. Uh, it's just that their na their neighborhood is quitely it, it, it's more um, uh, it, it's wider 
uh, but the, the focus is the same as the Gulf monarchies. Really, it's, it is China that is very unique in this sense. It has the widest aperture um, and it's noticeably focusing on the emerging and developing world. Specifically, you know, in places where institutions um, are young and economic incentives in particular uh, work wonders and they're very appealing. So what can open societies do about this? Um, first and foremost, um, we need to be aware that this form of shop power exists. Um, you know, awareness is the first step um, to concerted action. If you don't know what's going on, then you cannot act on it. Uh, it seems like uh, an obvious comment, but I think it's a very important one. You know, today still there are many uh, educational and research institutions uh, that are still considering their authoritarian counterparts um, as their true equivalents, as their true equals, um, and they assume that they share similar values, and and they tend to, I think, underestimate the risk that. Uh, uh, these kinds of activities are going to uh, pose to their own um, intellectual integrity. Many of these institutions rely on economic resources and cooperation with their authoritarian counterparts, and these inducements can create leverage uh, that can be used by authoritarian powers, again, both to achieve a level of self-censorship. You don't want to... Um, um, you know, create problems uh, with your sponsors, for example, or constrict the thinking and discussion space, uh, but also again, to shape the production of intellectual output along the lines that are more favorable uh, to um, authoritarian regimes and their policies. So I think this is really important to remember. Um, and this works very well in, you know, open democracies, open societies, um, educational and research institutions where the sharing of ideas is something natural. So you're open to others and you're, you're able to accept uh, any kind of counterpart because you're willing to have this discussion. I think in this uh, space, it's very uh, crucial um, that the non-government sectors in the democracies um, play a critical uh, role in, in, I think, bringing this kind of awareness, um, but also uh, in developing the strategies that will help strengthen uh, the, the institutional integrity, uh, such as due diligence and accountability. So know what is going on, but also start to prepare for better protecting yourself about it. And the, the non-governmental sec, uh, sector um, society, civil society has a, has a lot of um, uh, important role to play in this domain. Third, I think because authoritarians operate globally, uh, I think that democratic countries should also try to cooperate among the, themselves to exchange best practices, to exchange information, and then to exchange, identify the, the practices that, that work best for themselves and then share them with other, um, uh, with other uh, counterparts around the world. Um, the exercise of sharp power in the knowledge sector is a problem for all democracies, but I think the young ones, you know, in places where institutions are still in the process of being consolidated, um, I think are even more at risk. And uh, it's especially important for advanced industrial democracies to um, help them build that kind of resilience and, and, and share the, the resilience measures and practices that they might have. So just to, to conclude, um, the outcome of the authoritarians' shop power efforts to, to constrict and, and shape this intellectual space is not preordained. Um, as long as democracies are first aware of what's going on, 
and second, start to cooperate in concert to uh, deal with it. So I'll, I'll conclude with that and looking forward to our uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Nadej, especially for highlighting some of these strategies that democratic actors and civil society institutions in particular can start thinking about uh, in order to band together and work together to accelerate democratic learning. I'd, I'd like to next turn to Nicholas Wright and ask Nick, you know, with the emergence of so many new technologies that seem to be changing and evolving at such a rapid rate, um, to be honest, I'm sure many in our audience um, have a hard time, as well as I do, um, sometimes have a hard time keeping up with, uh, with the pace of change and um, with fully understanding some of the um, decision making that and the process that goes into designing these technologies and um, more specifically governing them and how they're applied as well. Could you tell us a little bit about the risks that you've observed in um, you know, surrounding the application of some of these new technologies like artificial intelligence, um, as well as others that might relate to or be involved in data collection and surveillance? Oh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm obviously going to say thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica, and uh, obviously Chris and, and Shanti and Cooper and all, all the team at the National uh, Endowment. It was, it was really uh, a fun project in the end. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to make your life a bit more difficult by telling you that there's been a recent uh, significant announcement of a new AI system in China within the last three weeks, which I'm going to open with. Um, but I'd also just say that I think a critical issue here is it's not only about risks. There are massive benefits uh, to all these new technologies. Uh, and, and, and it, you know, th there is a real risk in this type of forum that one is constantly going on and on about how well, all of these terrible risks and it's all going to be a disaster. And, and one ends up sounding a bit of a, you know, uh, a bit of a, a Cassandra, perhaps. So, so I think, you know, we have to think about both positives and negatives. So what happened uh, uh, within the last three weeks? What, what was announced? So Chinese uh, researchers uh, announced a new uh, AI model called Wudao uh, 2.0. So uh, if you uh, had lunch with uh, people who work in AI companies or, or research, you'd all have been chatting about this over your sandwiches. Um, so what is Wudao 2.0 and what, what, why does it matter and, and what does it help illustrate? So Wudao 2.0 is a gigantic new AI model. Uh, and, and, and one thing to say is, is that it's big. It's really, really big. So, uh, and this is a key feature of the new AI sort of stuff that we have now. So AI is essentially machines that can do things that would be thought uh, intelligent in humans. So they're good at things like perception. They can be as good as perception in a, uh, that, that a human would do, looking, identifying a picture of a monkey and, and distinguishing from a picture, a picture of a spoon. Okay, so that's what AI is. It's things, it's machines that can do things that would be thought intelligent uh, in humans. And this new Wudao 2.0 is really big. Um, and, and it uh, is about, uh, uh, so there was a, a, a leap in 2012. So the reason why, why I'm here today is because essentially there's a leap around 2012 and how good AI became. And what we've been doing since then uh, uh, is essentially just making a sort of plowing that, that furrow, sort of mining that seam and expanding on, 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 on that uh, uh, set of deep learning technologies. And Wudao 2.0 is really big. It uses massive amounts of computing power and it uses uh, huge amounts of data. Uh, and, and really, in many, obviously, it's more sophisticated than the ones uh, that were around uh, in 2012 that made this big leap. But essentially, that one of the critical things is that it's just really, really big. And that comes to a, another key point that this illustrates was that this is essentially a game in which there are two players now in the world, the United States and China. Nobody else is really uh, at that level because it's just so big. The amount of money, the amount of computing power you need is so vast. So uh, the uh, comparison of Wudao 2 uh, is often made to GPT-3, which is uh, OpenAI's uh, um, uh, AI model. So OpenAI is on, on the west coast of the US. 
And the OpenAI GPT-3 model is very good at generating uh, convincing speech and things like that. So, uh, and what, but what WeDAO2 can do, not a, it's 10 times bigger, essentially, in, in the size of the AI models. It's about 10 times as powerful as in, sort of by some measures as the, the US um, model. And what it can do that the US model can't do is it can do many different things. So it can uh, generate text from, uh, uh, it can generate sort of uh, classical Chinese poems. It can recognize what people are saying and uh, understand what they're saying, including their grammar. It can generate realistic pictures based on descriptions. Um, and it can also predict the 3D structures of proteins. So it can do lots of different things because it's bigger. And basically only the US and China now have the capability to make these really giant AI models. Um, so to give you an example, the uh, German, uh, the, the chair of the German Federal AI Association said, uh, when this was announced, we're about to lose digital sovereignty in the AI space if we don't act right now. So basically, that's not to say other countries can't do things. So, for example, uh, Britain, uh, the UK has a lot of cutting edge uh, AI research, for example, DeepMind, uh, which is a sort of Google's leading AI um, research organisational institute is based in London. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, who sort of was the architect in many ways of the key breakthrough back in 2012. He's based in Toronto and was previously at the same mind that DeepMind was spun out of in London. So there are things that allies can do, for example, for the US, but essentially this is now a US-China race. Another thing is, is that this brings huge uh, commercial uh, uh, opportunities, certainly potentially. Um, for example, uh, Google is very interested in this type of new technology because what it wants you to do is type in a new search term uh, and then it, the, the AI will generate a brilliant response for you. And that this may well be the way we all do search in the future. And that is obviously a non-trivially large market as Google's gigantic, you know, uh, trillion dollar, uh, over trillion dollar uh, market capitalization indicates. But this is also dual use technology. So clearly the ability to create images, create text convincingly, uh, you could do fantastic market segmentation, probably using this type of AI. This is all dual use technology for things like information operations. Um, and then another thing that WuDAO 2.0 illustrates is that um, there are much stronger links. So this was announced um, uh, by the Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence, which is uh, more strongly linked and funded by the Chinese government uh, than, for example, OpenAI or uh, uh, DeepMind uh, that are more private sector funded. So WUDAO 2.0 is uh, a big deal and it explains a lot of why we're here today because this is a very powerful technology. Um, and the reason why it's powerful is not just because the technology is so good at analyzing information, but also because our lives are now uh, permeated by data collecting devices. So, and, and if we think about the near future, so five, 10 years from now, what are we gonna be in? We're basically going to be in a world where we are constantly surrounded by me well as we are i am literally speaking to you on a a surveillance machine right now surrounded by other surveillance machines uh but um we are constantly going to be surrounded by surveillance machines producing enormous amounts of data data is not very useful in itself but what the data can be when you have something like wudai 2.0 in the future which will be you know this will be commercialized and maybe, maybe rolled out at scale in, in commercial applications then you can turn that data into information. And when you use that also with humans who are good at doing context and that kind of stuff, then what you end up with is really useful knowledge for influencing people. And that influence could be getting them to buy more trousers or skirts or cups of tea or whatever it is that you want them to buy, or it could be influencing them uh, in, in other ways that one might see as more nefarious. So, and I think the reason why I've sort of stressed the WeDAO 2.0 uh, angle is that this isn't hype there is i know a lot of people say all oh, this ai stuff it's all hype this isn't hype this is a really big deal uh and china in particular is very uh, good at this technology extremely good at it better than everybody else essentially other than the united states so where does that where does that leave us so um thinking about uh, protecting democracies and hopefully expanding democracies and so on and so forth. So I think there are two uh, important concepts and these are things that were sort of you know, di di discussed in, in, in the paper. So one important concept is that there are huge upsides to surveillance. So if you look at the development of societies 
uh, uh, such as Britain or the United States, um, over the past couple of hundred years, you've seen uh, surveillance as a critical part of uh, socioeconomic development and political development. Things like, you know, surveillance of public health, um, the Factory Act um, to uh, prevent um, uh, labour uh, problems, uh, police, uh, the institution of police. All of these things have been developed and expanded. And for example, in the UK and the US, whilst they've been expanded, the surveillance capacities of the state and of private sector and academia have all been expanded significantly. Simultaneously, you know, I think we can argue we've seen a, a reasonable deepening as well of um, democracy. So there are huge upsides of surveillance, as COVID has, has, has just amply demonstrated. Um, but at the same time, um, there are always obviously dangers of surveillance. So in addition to the upsides of surveillance, there's also the issue of what's called affordances. So I, I hate uh, I hate to introduce any sort of slightly tiresome uh, social, sort of social science or psychological technical term, but I'm going to introduce one, which is affordances. So affordances, so an object affords. So what are affordances? So they are the possibilities for action that an actor perceives that their environment or the tools that they have give to them. So let me um, give you an example of affordances. So affordances would be, uh, you know, to someone with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, uh, for people who work in strategy, they say capabilities create intentions. If you have the capability to surveil and influence your population, then that may well create the intention to do so and so forth. So I think that a critical issue here is to provide as much of the uh, upside of AI supported surveillance as possible, things like public health and, you know, shopping and all the other stuff that we, we want without creating the technological affordances for uh, increased authoritarianism. So um, how can we do that? So obviously the report goes through a wide variety of different uh, things, but I'll just sort of highlight uh, um, uh, four quick areas. So first is when you're building uh, systems for storing and analysing data. And I highlight here, for example, even the World Bank, their flagship World Development Report that was published um, uh, um, within the last few months. Um, it basically says you should create a giant uh, uh, integrated data system about your national population. What I would argue is, is that that's a terrible idea and that there should be silos. Data should be siloed and there should be very clear uh, technical and legal uh, means for siloing data so that AI cannot learn from um, uh, the value. The, basically, AI does better the more data it has and the more types of data it has, so you can't get AI to learn from those wide-ranging types of data. Secondly, um, there have long been discussions about a free borderless internet and it's great and all that kind of stuff, and other people have said, no, no, in Russia and China, um, there should be uh, digital sovereignty. I think all of those debates are, are finished. Um, and uh, now clearly we do have, uh, everybody is now along the lines of some form of digital sovereignty. Uh, and um, so what we need is democratic digital sovereignty that protects individuals uh, and enables um, democratic states to function, for example, to collect taxes. And so one of the things that civil society can do is help us understand the, uh, in a granular way, how we can have digital sovereignty about flows of data and analysis of data and so on and so forth, and how we can uh, help uh, particularly uh, vulnerable swing states who don't have the capacity to analyze those types of, of uh, uh, challenges um, to, um, to understand those problems. Um, third, um, sharp power within, uh, particularly within global swing states. It's critical to, to, to realise that almost all of the money that's spent by Facebook and Google and others for on research to research new AI techniques uh, and computational techniques is about essentially about means to influence people, means to better influence them. Uh, essentially, it's offensive information. Right. What, so one other thing that civil society can do is help uh, develop tools for defending people, give people and states, for example, Peru or Bolivia or Guinea-Bissau, give them the tools to defend themselves. The states, who do, you know, none of those states have sophisticated capabilities, give, help give them the, the tools and the individuals within them the tool to defend themselves. The fourth area is sharp power in uh, international fora. So it's really important um, 
to understand that there are different ways that uh, AI can be implemented. So you can, you, for example, all of the, the Internet of Things that is going to be surrounding us from our fridges to our cars and whatever, they can either have privacy built in, more uh, free and liberal principles built in, or they can have more authoritarian mechanisms of control built in. Right? There are, these are just technical decisions that can be made. Um, and so civil society has a role in uh, helping with transparency uh, around um, these international fora and identifying issues. And so I'll just um, conclude with a sort of a lunch uh, metaphor, which is that China is offering, people often criticize China for, you know, for offering people what seems like a free lunch. But if there's any free lunch, it's likely to be, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing as a free lunch. And, and if you're offered a free lunch and you are the lunch, but the thing is China is offering people a lunch. And I think what we need to do is we need to offer um, uh, people, particularly in the developing world, alternatives that uh, uh, provide them with, um, provide them with uh, uh, the benefits of AI, the upsides of surveillance, uh, without affording authoritarian, uh, a slight authoritarian control. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, and I'm also glad that you raised the um, very critical and important um, benefits of uh, of some of these surveillance technologies, uh, because it is precisely what makes them so attractive um, to many um, many democracies around the world um, who are naturally interested in trying to solve governance challenges. Um, I um, maybe before we turn to Mark Platner for comments, you know, I just wanted to ask you perhaps a follow up question um, that relates to this, and that's uh, I think very. We ha it hasn't been brought up yet, but um, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we, of course, around the world, um, you know, this has disrupted so many facets of governance and so much, uh, so many different dynamics around the world. And many governments have turned to um, technological solutions to help mitigate some of the challenges that they're dealing with. I was wondering if you could share with us any observations you have about um, any trends that may have evolved over the last year in particular, um, anything else that's, um, you know, perhaps especially worrying um, in the way that you've seen democracies, uh, have they been too rapid to adopt some of these technologies without fully debating them? And is there anything that, um, again, just sort of um, going back to some of the very important recommendations you offered about um, ways that, uh, especially those in, uh, more advanced democracies or the democracies that um, may already um, uh, have some norms or guidelines around the use of technologies, how can we accelerate the sharing of, of the, that learning in those conversations? Yeah, I mean, so, so I mean, there's a very interesting debate is did COVID change anything or did it just speed things up? Um, you know, and, 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 and lots of people have this debate. And I would say that actually with AI and tech and COVID, um, this is a case, or digital technologies rather than COVID, this is a case where actually there were different ways that things could have gone and COVID actually has pushed things in a particular direction. And what I mean by that is that, that um, say, so I, 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 you know, I know lots of doctors, I'm a doctor, a uh, medical doctor, and um, it was very, very difficult to get people to do consultations online to talk about pr very private uh, medical problems uh, online. And, and it was very difficult to get, actually implement that within organizations. Uh, and there were all sorts of legal issues and all sorts of ethical issues, and you know, not a lot was really happening. Suddenly COVID arrives uh, and you have a colossal switch, um, you know, in the US, UK, Israel, all around, basically, I, I don't, uh, those are the cases I know best. You have a huge switch to digital, um, medical platforms. Um, and you've, we've really done that without um, any of the discussions about privacy that we would have had. Now, you can say maybe that's a good thing and we've had all of this radical transformation and so on and so forth. But I think that illustrates the point that in key areas like medicine, where there is very, very sensitive and important data, which is often actually, for example, in a country like the US or UK is treated in a different way legally to other types of data. Um, you've you've had a significant um, uh, uh, transformation during COVID, where um, uh, digital media are used, and there really has been very very little discussion about 
about increased um, privacy. But um, that said, uh, it, more broadly, uh, I, I think that it, it is just the case, that, you know, it, it's the classic thing, it is, an, it is a, um, the, it, so every, so public health is based on surveillance. And so this is like the thing by the upside of surveillance. Public health, the essence, if you go back to the origin of public health, which was like the, the famous case of the, of the Broad Street pump, which was in Soho in London, it was about collecting data at a population scale in order to affect behaviour and therefore reduce the incidence of cholera. Right, that, that, that's what it was about. Um, so public health was inevitably going to use population level surveillance because that's what public health does. And, and in many ways, I think because we've been so successful with the with the vaccines, probably the biggest question we face now is because we've seen what, what if you ask the question, what does success look like with COVID? Success basically looks like South Korea or Taiwan um, uh, or Australia or New Zealand. And so um, I think what we've got to be very careful about is how we build our, because we will build vast new surveillance capabilities to look for future pandemics. The question is, how do we build those um, without uh, building in uh, uh, affordances uh, for potential authoritarian misuse? Thank you, Nick. Now I'd like to turn to Mark Platner. Uh, if he has been, I'm afraid he's been having a few connection problems, so he might be, are you able to join us by phone, Mark? Yeah, I'm not able to hear you, so you might try unmuting yourself. Is there a way to do so on, on your phone? Okay, well, while we are working out some of, oh, I still can't hear you, Mark. Um, while we're working out some of these uh, technical difficulties, and we will try to get back to you, Mark, um, if you could please try to keep reconnecting. Um, I want to also just raise um, the fourth area of uh, in which we, um, in the, the report series on sharp power and democratic resilience, in which we also tried to explore um, the impact of authoritarian influence, and that is in, in and through commerce. Um, and as well as um, a term that uh, that we've adopted um, and which was introduced by um, the Center for International Private Enterprise, uh, which is called corrosive capital. Um, we don't have one of the report authors um, from those specific papers on the panel, but I do want to take advantage of um, both Nadej Roland and Edward Lucas's deep knowledge of uh, China and Russia's activities in this sphere. And I was wondering if I could um, turn to the two of you to uh, perhaps briefly explain um, how how it how uh, both um, the authorities in Beijing and Moscow are able to exert influence in this sphere, including through um, you know a, a, um, what many understand to be the private sector, as well as through the use of uh, intergovernmental agreements and other types of economic activities. So um, I might perhaps ask. Nadege to comment first. You're putting me on the spot. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, you know, with with corrosive capital, as with sharp power, as with, you know, every uh, domain that we've been discussing this morning, what's interesting to uh, underline is that um those, those are only tools uh that are used differently and for a different objective or outcome uh from the democratic liberal democratic uh, critic side or from author the authoritarian side and for um you know going back to this idea of how authoritarian powers are basically trying to act internationally as they do domestically. This is really uh, the case for the PRC. Um, the party state wants to, or has come to a point where it basically can control all the aspects of um, you know, civil society, um, um, uh, 
uh, economic life, economic activities, political activities within its own borders. So it has this capacity. And even though, you know, there's a there's a huge and vibrant private sector in China, it is increasingly under the the realm of uh, national legislation that prevents it from um, having that broad freedom, uh, as we would think in our own societies with our own companies or corporate uh, or private enterprises. Um, so what the PRC is trying to do internationally is to exert this kind of control over the um, economic activities of these Chinese companies abroad and increasingly um, to exert that kind of influence using the economic leverage over other companies decisions and choices and over the past you know several years now recent recent times uh, we have seen an, uh, uh, an increasing um, effort to uh, for example constrict Taiwan's uh, space um, through the corporate world so um, recently you've seen um, You've seen that in the uh, in the movie industry, uh, where uh, people have been worried that they won't have access to the Chinese market, and therefore uh, they have publicly come in support of uh, the so-called One China principle. Um, you have seen that in uh, with. Uh, airline companies that have also changed uh, the destination uh, on their website and not using Taiwan, but using province of China or something like that in their uh, in their denomination of of, uh, of Taiwan to again, please uh, Beijing's preferences. So this is these are just tiny examples of how this um, shaping um, of how this corrosive capital or this economic clout can be used in order to basically um, exert pressure um, either directly or indirectly uh, so that other companies and other actors outside the world do Beijing's bidding. Thank you, Nadej. Edward, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to, to do the same for Russia and to explain um, for our audiences. Uh, some of the relationships between um, uh, private entities uh, and the Kremlin. Yes. Um, well, first of all, there's a huge difference in scale between um, Russia and China, and China is integrated into the global economy in a way that Russia isn't. And most countries, most businesses could stop doing business with Russia tomorrow and it wouldn't make a huge difference, except possibly in terms of oil and oil and gas. And even there, increasingly, there are alternatives. So it's very important to sort of see those, those different orders of orders of magnitude here. I see Russian corrosive capital um, as much more limited. Um, Nadej has, has highlighted what I think the rather cumbersome term is hegemonic discourse control that China, the Chinese party state, believes that all discussion of China anywhere in the world, the use of terminology, even quite small decisions about what goes into a dictionary or an encyclopedia, that they have a say in this and they'll apply pressure and try and do stuff to um, influence you know, the way a British academic publishing house um, does business. And there's nothing like that from the Russians. I mean, if you can ima if you imagine the pandemic had started in Ru in Russia rather than in China, could you imagine the Russians being able to put um, pressure on the Lancet, on Nature, on other scientific publishers, or on universities to try and decry the lab leak theory as a conspiracy theory? It just wouldn't work. If you had a Chinese, uh, a Russian counterpart to Tibet or Taiwan or Tiananmen Square, one of these three hot button issues. Could you imagine the Russians being able to put pressure on universities and publishing houses to steer clear of that? No, you couldn't. Um, the, 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 Rus the Russian focus is much tighter and the ambitions, I would say, in a way more, um, more limited or more modest. And 
the aims are, first of all, pure self-interest. Let's keep laundering the money in the West. Um, it's a very simple thing. You steal money in Russia from natural resource rents or from bureaucratic rents, and then you don't want to keep the money in Russia. You don't want to invest it in brotherly Belarus or Tajikistan or Donbass or anywhere like that because you know what those places are like. And so you want to invest it in, in real estate in London and so on. And so there's quite a tight focus on keeping the um, political pressure up on the gatekeepers for these financial flows. And so that means, for example, you give money to conservative politicians in Britain so that the conservative government here doesn't really worry too much about um, tightening the rules in the, in the city of London. That's a very sort of simple thing. Then the sort of second order um, is on geopolitical influence, um, keeping the, um, you know, making sure that Germany, in particular in Europe, which is the most important country from a Russian point of view, indeed from any point of view, um, that Germany feels deep economic ties to Russia and that these feed into um, corporate Germany via business, but also to some extent um, via the trade union movement and and and, and the left, that, that there's an and and, and, and the, the idea that Germany's prosperity is linked to its uh, depends on its ties with Russia, and this is super important and and mustn't be um, become hostage to what they would depict as geopolitical games, American pressure, and so on. And we saw that super clearly with Nord Stream. Nord Stream isn't really about exporting gas. Nord Stream is about exporting political influence. The gas is just the kind of the 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 the, the vector. It's about undermining um, Ukraine because Ukraine has transit rev um, revenues. It's about undermining trust in Germany among the. Germany's eastern neighbours, it's about weakening the Atlantic Alliance, there's all sorts of um, effects. The fact you're actually selling a few extra molecules of gas to Germany is, is in a way the least important thing. So I think those are two of the important, um, you know, the, 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 the self-interest of money laundering, the geopolitical goals. Then there's a little bit about um, also of, of supporting other things. So you have um, support sports teams because that and support um, you know, cultural things, art galleries and so on, and that all creates a kind of nice grey zone in which you can then maybe do um, influence operations or possibly recruit people or um, place someone in a, a, a useful position. Um, I think those are the main things, and I do worry about all of these, and they're bad, um, but it's this isn't you know, the 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 isn't the same. It, all, all Russia really wants is in the West is for Western countries to be weak and not able to get together and constrain Russia. Um, it's it's it, they have no illusions about actually dominating Europe, and you would never see a Russian counterpart to the Belt and Road Initiative or anything like that. Um, they don't even particularly want to control the Russian diaspora. And they don't see the presence of a Russian diaspora in the West as a sort of great threat to their legitimacy. Whereas on the Chinese side, obviously, I'm not a China expert, so I only know from reading great work by Nadezhda and, and others. Um, but you know, there's a sort of far more maximalist, um, hegemonic um, approach on the on the Chinese side, exemplified by the United Front Work Department and all the things that they do. Thank you, Edward. Um, it looks like we now have Mark Platner on the line. Are you there, Mark? Yes, I'm here. If you can hear me. Wonderful. Okay. I'd now like to turn okay. it over to you. <laughs> We're thrilled All that right, you're sorry. here. Um, I think my brief comments probably were not worth waiting for, but uh, let me go ahead with them anyway. Um, I thought I the most useful contribution I might be able to make is offering a little bit of historical background on the forum's work on sharp power, as well as a few reflections on the changes in the world that have today made sharp power a subject of so much intense interest and concern. Carl already uh, covered some of the history. I suppose I should have expected that. Um, but I can add a few points that may be of interest to uh, to listeners. Um, when we started this project in 2014, it was with the support of the Smith Richardson Foundation. 
And uh, it was a project led by Chris Walker on the resurgence of authoritarianism. And it generated a number of articles that first we published in the Journal of Democracy and then gathered in an edited volume, uh, edited by Larry Dime and Chris uh, and me, and published in 2016, as Carl mentioned, under the title, Authoritarianism Goes Global. And the book consisted of two parts. The first contained country articles on the leading authoritarian powers, Russia, China, and so on. Uh, but the second part featured articles on topics such as disinformation, propaganda, cyberspace, election monitoring, and international organizations and norms. It was subtitled, Arenas of Soft Power Competition, with the word soft power in quotes. But in his concluding chapter to the book, Chris uh, Walker made it clear that he was not happy with using the term soft power to apply to authoritarian efforts in the realm of ideas and culture. And instead, he saw the practices of the authoritarians as, quote, a malign mirror image of soft power, not really the same thing for all its resemblances. So I would say that our book, when it came out, received respectful but pretty limited attention. We arranged to launch it at events not only in Washington, but also in Berlin, Brussels, London, and Copenhagen. And it was po received politely enough, but most audiences seemed unconvinced that it was really a subject of great concern. Um, but the forum persisted with its work in this area. And again, as Carl mentioned, in 2017, it published a report by Chris and Jessica Ludwig entitled Sharp Power Rising Authoritarian Influence, which then was featured in a cover story in The Economist and really brought worldwide attention to this issue. And no doubt the coining of the term sharp power was critical in this regard. And here I have a concession that I, a confession that I feel obliged to make. Uh, which is when Chris first came to me saying that he wanted to use the term sharp power to characterize what the authoritarians were doing, I told him I thought it was an infelicitous term that would never catch on. Was I ever wrong? Uh, all I can say uh, in my partial defense is that when I, I finally said, well, okay, Let's uh, send it out into the world and we'll see how readers react. Uh, and in fact, they uh, seized upon the term. It may not be the most elegant, but it did help to capture something that was new in the behavior of contemporary authoritarians. Although it's not easy to pinpoint precisely where the novelty is. Uh, as I think uh, Ed Lucas mentioned, and Various veterans of the Cold War have pointed out the Soviet Union regularly had resorted to disinformation, propaganda, support for front groups in democratic countries, various dodgy tactics in international organizations, and the like. But I would say, perhaps this is obvious, but there are really two factors that have ramped up the salience of sharp power today and that emphasize its distinctive quality and the kind of soft power that used by democracies that preceded it. Uh, and these two factors are also those that have transformed world politics more generally. Globalization on the one hand and technological advance on the other. But of course, the impact of these two is intertwined just uh, as their evolution has been intertwined. Because the world is interconnected so much more now, the arenas in which countries deal with one another have multiplied. And the new communications technology allow authoritarians to intrude within democracies in ways that they never could have done before, uh, except by sending spies within our countries, which uh, is a much more difficult and, and complicated and risky business. And, Indeed, I think it was the revelation of Russian meddling in the 2016 U.S. elections that finally helped convince people that sharp power could inflict the most serious kinds of damage. And today we see that again with uh, 
uh, ransomware and so on. People are really waking up to how serious these uh, uh, various uh, uh, tactics can be. And, you know, perhaps it's a stretch, but one might even claim that the discovery uh, of sharp power, the concept of sharp power, has helped change in, in some ways the shape of contemporary international politics. For example, I think the growing perception that China is not just a military and economic competitor, but a threat to democracy, uh, owes a good deal to the exposure that people like Nadez and others uh, have carried out of its resort to the tools of sharp power uh, and what a nasty way it behaves. And more generally, I'd say the use of these kinds of tactics by authoritarian powers has underlined the gap that separates democracy from autocracy, helping to move the conflict between these two competitive types of regimes to the forefront, to the forefront of current U.S. foreign policy, as President Biden made clear in his remarks, recent remarks in Europe. So I'd say Chris and Jessica and their colleagues at the forum and the uh, outstanding contributors who spoke here today and the others who weren't here uh, have been remarkably successful in developing the concept of sharp power in getting people to understand why it's so important that democracies mount an energetic and effective response to it. And I'm hopeful that the team will have comparable success in convincing civil society and the private sector that they, along with government, have a crucial role to play in countering the efforts of the authoritarians to penetrate our democracies. Thanks, sorry for the delay and uh, my computer problems. Thank you, Mark. Um, I appreciate your candor as well as, um, again, your perspective since you, um, especially being at the helm of the Journal of Democracy, um, for so many years, uh, you know, you've really observed all of these trends playing out. And I think it is critically important to understand, um, you know, where all of this is situated in the course of history and in the um, back and forth struggle to, you know, between uh, democracies and authoritarians to um, to disseminate their narratives and, uh, you know, which side seems to have momentum at one particular time um can is always up for debate but uh you know it's also a reminder too that we have a lot to be hopeful about despite um uh, you know as we look back um and see that that this is you know this contestation um it has been a constant um there's still many opportunities for things to be done um especially on behalf of uh freedom and democracy and human rights around the world um, so we we don't have um, a great deal of time left. So what I'd like to do is uh, pose a, a couple of questions to for any of our speakers to answer, and then also give you an opportunity to um, decide to respond to those, any selection of those, and provide any final remarks that you'd like to make. Um, the first question is one that we received from Andrew Wilson, the executive director of the Center for International Inter. Uh, for international and private enterprise. Um, and it relates to, um, many, there have been um, in many cases, uh, for example, um, around the world, a, a growing recognition of economic risks and um, in some cases in, in local context, political blowback associated with BRI projects. Um, and uh, he notes that um, in many of these circumstances, uh, or as a result of some of these, actually, the, the Chinese Communist Party uh, has showed adaptability in its selection management in terms of its projects. Are we seeing similar adaptations in other spheres of sharp power projection? So that's one question um, about evolutions and adaptations, um, which I suspect we'll get some interesting uh, comments from all of you about. Um, the other thing, the other question I'd, I'd really like to raise has to do with um, recommendations and ideas uh, for civil society, including the private sector, to think about. Um, you know, all of you, I think, raised 
um, the financial pressures that many civil society and um, even, you know, the financial considerations, of course, are obviously more very important in the private sector, um, but they carry over to um, civil society and many of the other institutions, um, like in the knowledge generation uh, sector and um, even media outlets. It's of concern for everyone. But how, how do we think about strategies that um, encourage these institutions to consider the non-financial costs of financial engagement with uh, counterparts um, and institutions and firms uh, based in autocratic settings and that might be linked to those regimes or um, beholden to the authorities in those countries. Um, specifically, um, you know, thinking about uh, the power of reputation, and that's something that, that matters a lot. Um, I'd, I'd be very interested to hear from any of you um, your thoughts on that as well. Um, so do we have any volunteers for who might like to, to take the first uh, stab at those um, and offer concluding remarks? If not, I'll call on one of you. <laughs> All right, maybe I'll turn to uh, to Nick first, if you don't. Yeah, mind. no, I'm happy. So uh, uh, we've got we've got 40 seconds each. So um, so I'd say, I mean, obviously, there's enormous adaptation. Uh, there's always adaptation to the character of the technologies and societies that you have. So an example would be uh, in the interwar period, uh, Hitler was brilliant at harnessing uh, radio. And a variety of other media propaganda and that he, he, he you know um uh he he uh or, 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 or the, the the german um uh, plans for example in the gray zone conflict when they were going into places like um uh, uh, then Czechoslovakia and so on had very very uh, uh well articulated propaganda complaints and so on um and and you know then there's a brilliant book by thomas ridd as a scholar at Johns Hopkins, looking at how um, active measures were, were, you know, have evolved over the over the years, used by the Russians and so on. So I think there's always going to be adaptation, and, and we just need to be sure uh, or try and, and adapt as fast, if not faster, than um, those who would seek to do us harm. But I just want to say the um, I was trying to think what are the key things I would say to civil society uh, people who actually are trying to make a difference rather than just writing about making a difference like 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 i did in this case so i'd say one thing is about priorities so there are so many things about uh, so big tech companies in particular will try and deflect um uh, people away from the really big things that threaten their business models things like trying to break you know trying to introduce silos n try and prevent them from getting their hands on key data like medical data and data from children and that type of thing that, that they will try and deflect civil society from that uh, by and i don't i'm not belittling these issues at all but by uh, trying to focus people on things like issues of bias and explainability in uh, digital systems um, because fundamentally those those don't really affect their business model and so I think there's a really critical issue here of prioritizing things like the huge accretion of data that a lot of the big tech companies are trying to have and agglomerators and others, which I would just say is literally exactly what, if you read the Chinese uh, documents that they're trying to do with social credit score and all sorts of other things they're doing, they're trying to create vast data repositories and databases. So, you know, you're, we're, we're building, you know, essentially the, the senior from authoritarian state. The other thing I'd say that's really practical is that global networks that in that have technically minded and legally minded and technically capable people in to do practical things, because so often you just you, you actually just need people with expertise. And, and a lot of countries and a lot of societies don't have enough people with that type of expertise. We see this with, you know, things like COVID, um, drug uh, um, uh, you know, approvals, vaccine approvals and whatever. It's exactly the same thing with all these complex technical issues. And I think one of the things that civil society should do is try and create global networks with people with legal and technical expertise um, who can help civil society uh, and adapt for the local situations across those, those, those um, local uh, uh, realities. Thank you, Nick. Next, I might uh, call on Adej. Yeah, thank you. I, I would just um, reiterate um, what Nick just said about adaptation. Uh, we are, our societies are also extremely adaptable, um, but I think it goes back to the discussion we had earlier, which is about 
acknowledging what is what it is exactly that we're facing so that then we can find solutions for that and then true that uh, we need to um be faster in in adapting um it's it's a it's a very important observation um that was made by the by the question you know it's true that these systems are not you know caught in the middle of the road they are really adaptive and so it's it's on our end to, to try to to do better at, at doing that and um acknowledging what the problem is is also i believe the first step into answering the your other question jessica about the you know the non-financial cost and the reputational cost of it if you are starting to see um, those activities and policies as being um, taken by nefarious actors instead of seeing them as your natural counterparts, you might start to put in place a series of measures that protect yourselves better, um, protect yourself against the risk of being uh, pressured, and protect yourself against the risk of, of being caught into scandals uh, for, for your own reputation. So I think um, it, we're, we're just starting, thanks in part to the work you've been doing, to realize what the, what the, the nature of the challenge is. And I, I have great hope that this is going to impact the way um, different actors in civil societies see uh, the the authoritarian powers and the way they're going to start dealing with them. Thank you, Nadej. I'll turn it over to Edward Lucas. You can have the final word. These are huge subjects and time is very short. I think that normative pressures actually is our most powerful weapon. Um, it's the slowest, it's you sanctions and things like that are the kind of quick fixes and they feel good but what actually changes things is when people say i don't want to spend my life doing this i don't want to have to meet these people i don't want to have anything to do with it the whole thing and and and, and that's when um we really um raise the cost i'm worried that the technological advantage is so great and um, the gap between our ability to defend ourselves and their ability to attack us is growing not shrinking and there are all sorts of vulnerabilities in the way our economies work, which makes us and our legal systems work, which means that this Russian state sponsored or state tolerated cyber crime is really effective. And there's a lot more. This crime as a service is just um, you know, super worrying. I recommend people who haven't seen it already to read the book Willful Blindness which has just come out about the way in which the Chinese party state has been munching its way through um, through Canada. And this collection of data is, I think, the single most worrying thing because the Chinese Communist Party is building up databases with hundreds of millions, maybe a billion foreigners, and they know our biometrics, our financials, um, our location through our phones, our communications. They have insight into our society of, of a kind that we just haven't got and won't ever get in, into theirs. And with Bellingcat, we've seen that you can go through sort of badly run, corrupt um, countries like Russia and really turn the tables on them and do them a lot of damage just using um, ingenuity and open source tools. We don't seem to be able to do that to China and China seems really good at doing it to us. Thank you, Edward. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of those of you in our audience who have stayed with us through the full duration of the, the discussion today, um, and especially thank our uh, distinguished speakers, uh, Edward Lucas, Nadej Roland, Nicholas Wright, and Mark Platner, as well as the other authors who contributed um, to the series, and uh, especially my co-author on our final report, uh, Christopher Walker at the National Endowment for Democracy. Thank you to everyone again for your um, insightful remarks and um, especially for helping us start to put our finger on where those opportunities exist um, to promote greater democratic unity and solidarity in the face of these challenges. Um, with any luck, uh, by mobilizing the variety of uh, civic sphere institutions um, and uh, dedicated activists around the world who, who care deeply 
about um, threats to free expression and um, human rights, we can start uh, to really turn the tide and regain momentum on behalf of democracies. So um, thank you all again. It's been a great pleasure. Um, and I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of their day.